A bag of honor. Police officers and first responders wear badges to let their communities know they are here to protect and serve. But that's not how it feels today. And the stress of the job is taking its toll, taking lives through suicide and post-traumatic stress injury. A Badge of Honor podcast features the cast of the same name, Sam Horwitz and John Salerno. Sam, John, and the team offer the first responders workshops through their critical incident stress management teams and mental health liaisons to offer state-certified T. Cole credit programs that save lives. It's time to smash through the stigma. It's time to heal from your injury, and it's time to back our blue. Welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast. Here are your hosts, Sam Horowitz and John Salerno. Hey, welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam, powered by the OBBM Network. Uh, Hey, Sam, how's it going? It is going. Happy Monday, my friend. Man, it's been a a week. Uh, I hope everybody's trying to beat the heat and... uh, I thought we were getting a little reprieve over the weekend, but uh, it seems like it came back full force. I was just out in the backyard, and man, after 10 minutes, I was sweating. I was like, I need a cup of coffee. So I came in and hydrated with some coffee. It's not iced because, it, because yeah, yeah, it's real. No, no I'm not no. into that mocha, iced, no ice. latte stuff. The real stuff, the real stuff. You know, we got a we got an interesting guest on today, you know, with – he really ties into everything that uh, we've been discussing over the last couple of months. And, you know, he, his background is very, uh, it's very intriguing. He, he's done a lot. He's shared a lot. And he's very intellectually intelligent, I guess, if, if those two words get put together, right? Intellectually I think so. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess we'll have to ask him. He's a, he's a, uh, a, a law, law degree holder. So, uh yeah, it's been uh, one of those uh, weeks. I know we're all feeling the pressure. We've all uh, sometimes feel like just giving up, and um, it takes a lot of to. So, uh, you know, you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, you know, when you, when you say that, it has been a, an interesting bunch of weeks. It, it really is about, you know, realizing that with life, you've got to have a plan. Uh, it's, it's the chocolate chip cookie recipe that I've – referred to uh, in many podcasts and, and it's your plan because you're you like John has that John has his stuff that he does every morning to prep gets to work um, has his coffee throughout the day has his coffee in the evening has his coffee that's part of his success recipe and being the best John I'm being funny <laughs> yeah I, I, I know but you, you, you but said it's a true. cup, you said a cup. It's it's more like pots pots exactly, of coffee. yeah but it's true. So, so life is always going to be there. And when the shit goes sideways, have comfort in knowing that you can create a plan that works. And, and, you know, I'm just going to start off by reading an excerpt from the book because the and goal his book's title, his book's title says it all. Is, yes. It's how, to deal with damn near anything, okay? A paratrooper's guide to life. We'll 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 get John um, on here on screen in a second. But the the goal of the book, okay, is to ensure that when you are inevitably confronted with a challenge, in public or in private, by others' doubts or your own, that you have a way forward, a set of inner traits to develop that will empower you to keep making progress. Colleges or workplaces are not equipped to develop these traits. So it falls on each of us, each of us, to take the steps necessary to do so. And with that, I want to introduce and welcome John McLaughlin, the author of this incredible book, How to Deal deal with Damn Near Anything, The Paratrooper's Guide to Life. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, it, this, what I just read, this is, uh, and we talked about it before we came on. It's all the way at the end of the book. Sometimes the nuggets, the stuff that just, it jumps out when it jumps out. Well, you, right? gave up, you gave away the whole ending of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Well, well Spoiler we alert. talked about the recipe, right? So maybe I should have said, spoiler alert. No, but we talked and at the about- end, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> You get to do you, and the best way to do that is to 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 live empowered 
Um, but we all know that those doubts are gonna are gonna creep up. And you know, John, we we definitely have talked about that in our workshops. And so let let's dive in. You know, by having you introduce yourself and you know why why the army and and everything that you've done done since. You're a lawyer. You're an adjunct professor. So yeah, take it away. Well, sure. First, thanks again for having me. Sorry to hide the good part of the book way at the end. Hopefully there was something before then that was, uh, that was I mean, he kept lot. going, so there was something yes. in there. Um, no, thanks again for having me. So I joined the Army coming out of undergrad shortly after 9-11. And I went to undergrad at Florida State, and I had a great time. And it was funny, I didn't realize what my GPA was. I'd forgotten until I applied to law school on the GI Bill after I'd, at that point, had been in the Army for almost 10 years active duty. And I had, to, I had to fill out a form and, and send it to Florida State so they could mail me a copy of my GPA. And it was a 266. And I was like, well, I enjoyed 2.66 out of every four classes I went to, I guess. Because it basically, if I liked the class, I would show up. And if I didn't, I just wouldn't even go. So I clearly needed a little work in terms of discipline. And I thought the Army was a good place to provide that. So I enlisted, even though I had my college degree, I enlisted to be an Arabic linguist after 9-11 and ended up deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan. And then at that point was kind of, when I got to the almost 10 year mark, was like, all right, I need to make a decision. That decision was the National Guard. It was a way for me to stay in the military, keep doing something that meant a lot to me, but also you know, open up more places to live, maybe you know, meet some people, I, you know, not die alone was, was becoming an increasing priority. As I was, uh, you know, airborne infantry units got a lot of things, so many, enough good things for me to write a book about it, but not necessarily a lot of dating prospects. So got out, went to law school at University of Virginia, which is very gracious enough to let me in, and then met my wife there. And now I live in D.C., where I alternate between doing National Guard as a JAG, as a judge advocate, military lawyer, and then doing some civilian law stuff in between military stints. And uh, my wife and I have lived here for six years now. And the book came about because of the transition from getting out of the military. And it was very clear very quickly that there were things that worked and there were things that did not. <laughs> and it took me, even though it was clear immediately that it was a mixed reception to my decision to bring the military approach into a not military context, I didn't really wrap my head around why some things were working for me and some things weren't. And it took years. I didn't write the book till I'd been out at least seven years. And it, it took that much time for me to really take enough of a step back to realize, okay, here are the tools I got from the military that, that I can still use. And here are the ones that will be counterproductive to me trying to fit into wider society. So I realized that not only was that useful for me and for other people who've served in any capacity to, to get a look at what makes us special, but what makes us different too in ways that may not be useful. And other people, they don't have any obligation to deal with us. We got to adjust to the wider world. We can't just sit here and demand everybody change for us. So it was about we can. finding, we I mean, can we can. can. Oh, I, I tried that. I was, I brought- Come on, brought you live in Washington, D.C. You're just surrounded <laughs> yeah. by those people. Okay, he said it, not me. That, that was my old stomping ground, so. No, I, I like, I mean, I'm a big city guy. It's one of the reasons I left active duty. I was like, I'm never gonna live in a city any decent size. We, we are too loud and take up too much space to-, to If you're gonna be a here. lawyer, if you're gonna be a lawyer, especially a JAG lawyer, DC is the place to be. You have a lot of clientele right around you. I, there's a lot of opportunities. And it is it is amazing to be able to be in the military and live where I want to live. And just there's so many. And they're only getting more and more flexible with the, the options that you have. And one of the one of the good things about having written the book was it helped me clarify, okay, here's what I want. Here's the things I'm good at that I can put to use. Here's the things I need to work on that may keep me from getting what I want. And just able to clarify, here's where the opportunities are, here's where the, the challenges are. And that led to me getting some of these opportunities I have now, which have been really wonderful for me, whether it's teaching, like you mentioned, as part of at University of Maryland Global Campus, as part of their MBA program, or working at National Guard Bureau as a, a JAG and as an inspector general. And being able to have a little bit of distance from my, from my full-time military experience was crucial in me sorting out what I needed to to make these other opportunities happen. Yes, yeah, you know, John and I have, we've had a lot of uh, veterans on that are for in the first responder field now, or that have even transitioned out of that. And, 
you know, when you say, when you just said, take the time to understand, you know, what did not help you in the military and what did, one of, one of the common threads that you just shared and that we have it with, with the guests is that it did take some time to understand that because you did do uh, multiple tours in, Af uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. You've been in battle before you've seen, well, you've seen the good, bad and the, and the ugly and uh, in any bureaucracy coming after you're off the battlefield, even more ugly at times. How long did it take you to really make the transition to understand? I, I, I and I don't know if I'm saying this right, so please, uh, you know, take the words and do with it, correct them. But to put to put the 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 crappy stuff and leave that behind and recognize that that's not helpful. I mean, years. I mean, the, it's a very, very gradual process. And there's a phrase in the book, all progress is good progress. And it really is just stacking up tiny victories, one after another, after another, after another. And then you look back and you're like, man, compared to one or two or three or five years ago, I've made a lot of progress. And I, one of the things that the people that I've seen can sometimes get hung up on is expecting these eureka moments where everything clicks into place and the clouds part and the sunbeam comes down and the music plays and all of a sudden you figured everything out, right? And James Earl Jones's voice starts narrating it and just like, <laughs> that's it, that's the end of the movie. Like, that's not how it works. So there were times at law school, and it's funny because as you mentioned, a lot of folks from, go from military or, or law enforcement into first responder. And, you know, those circles overlap a lot. One of the good things about me going to law school where there was like nobody, basically, there were six veterans out of the 350 people in my law school class. Right. And that, that, that was like we had a Submariner and we had Air Force people. So like even our veteran experiences, there was some overlap there, but not a lot. And good luck to anybody who's ever been on a submarine. Those people, those people <laughs> serve, those people sacrifice. I was at least above ground the entire time. So I didn't have the ability to I had to change. I had to figure it out. I didn't have a choice. It was that or like, I can't, I mean, hang out with the same five people all the time and like they got their own, you know, things they want to do. So we had enough in common to serve as a resource, but I had to figure it out. So to loop back to your question, there was no one point where I could say it took X amount of time, but it was a process. I'd say for the first year or two, I was like, man, these people are weak. These people stress out over dumb shit. Like these, I was just judging, just, just casting lightning bolts back and forth. That was my, it was like, it was like I was getting paid to judge people. That's the level of enthusiasm I embraced it with. And then eventually it's like, this is not working. <laughs> like it, it doesn't matter whether the judgment's accurate or not. That's irrelevant. It's about whether you're actually accomplishing anything for you or for others by making those judgments. So maybe after that first phase of a year or two, it was like, okay, we got to, we got to, come up with something different. And then it started having those conversations with people who would have them with me and start to figure out at least a way forward the they could get me to that next step and the next and the next one after. Well, that's great. You know, the, you're already throwing out pearls of wisdom here. We got to take our first break, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. We are talking with the author of How to Deal with Damn Near Anything, John McLaughlin. We will be right back. Move freely, America, without medical restrictions or penalty. Without medical freedom legislation in place, our rights and freedoms are one vote away from being dissolved. Move freely, America, with one voice, without fear of retribution, achieving a common goal, medical freedom. We the people make our voices heard by connecting with state legislators and engaging a constitutionally compliant medical bill of rights for all citizens. Individually, change is improbable, but as an aggregate, attainable. It's time to act with one voice. My voice. And my voice. And my voice. And my voice. To protect our freedom, creating one voice that cannot be ignored. This requires your voice, too. Move Freely America. Go to movefreelyamerica.org to find a chapter near you. Plug in, donate, and help our legislators defend our God-given rights under the Constitution. Move Freely America. My voice. And my voice. And together with your voice, we're one voice that cannot be ignored. Donate today. Movefreelyamerica.org. Hey, welcome back to the award-winning, or the award-winning, not yet. We will we'll win an award we'll on the Ben Joanna podcast. <laughs> That's right. We did win an award when we were mad. Uh, ben yeah. Joanna podcast powered by the OBBM network. Uh, we've been talking, discussing 
life and uh and your book with john mclaughlin u.s army uh was it a ranger no just paratrooper i was actually a, a human intelligence guy it was part of being an arabic linguist my job was talking to people which came naturally well let's well, face it you were airborne you're yeah. a badass oh, yeah, absolutely i, I mean come I, on that's, that's that part crazy. absolutely but hey I understand it. I appreciate you clarifying that because it is important for folks that earn a particular distinction to for that to mean something. And I certainly don't want to come off claiming something I didn't have. So, yes, paratrooper is the right term. You know, uh, when we ended the first segment, Sam ended it with the words of wisdom. And just in the first, uh, I guess, 10 or 12 minutes speaking with you and listening to you, you know, not only are you a veteran and that you are a JAG officer, but you, you said you, you're a professor and you teach. I got to commend you because the way you speak and what you're going to be bringing to those students in your classroom, not only from a book, but from the experiences and the knowledge that you, you the way you portray it, each kid, man, is going to come out more valued. You really do a, a very well, very well, a very good job. Very well. I'll take hey, either one. High school diploma. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those kids are um are very lucky to have you thanks i'll let them know a lot of a lot of professors today and i know part of your book says you, you know you can't learn everything in education can't learn everything in a school or a college you know a high school or a college you got to experience it and what you're bringing is you're bringing the tools necessary for these kids to really you're sharing your experience which they're going to feel and they're going to be able to learn from true experience not just some teacher reading out of a book going, well, this is how I think it was. You, you're giving them real life knowledge. This is how it is. And this is the steps I took to get through it, which brings a lot more value to uh, education. Well, good. I appreciate that. And I try to sprinkle it in. I mean, they didn't hire me as a life coach. I have, you know, something specific I'm supposed to teach them as part of the MBA program. But when, when it's relevant, uh, I try to sprinkle in things that I think will also be helpful otherwise. Well, I, I got, I got to just uh, uh, throw my two cents in here. Um, based on what, what John said about and the importance and what you're bringing to your students. Um, you're, you're teaching at my uh, alma mater, although it's the global campus, you know, at University of Maryland. And um, it was the classes and courses that were taught by the adjunct professors that were where I took the most away, exactly what John just said, because of the real life knowledge and experience that you're imparting that you're bringing into the classroom that's why that's why as i was reading this book and, and we were talking before you know when when somebody picks up this book and they see you know you you've cited so many studies you've got the academia in this book um aside and i will say in partnership with that and why this book is important for everybody is that we we tend to focus when we're when we're in uniform and we've transitioned with you know the shit that we lived right and it's just like you said throwing the lightning balls what folks wake up why aren't you like doing this why you know too many cry baby snowflakes whatever oh, yeah. it is is that is it because when we transition it's like, ha, bye. Thanks for your 20, 10, 20, however many years. Don't let the door hit you on the back because the career will be there even after you leave. Yeah. One of the, I mean, it's the, the good thing and, and difficult thing about the military is the train keeps rolling. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't care if you were Mr. All-Star, Super Ninja, top of the rank, the best ever. You're leaving and, and we got to keep going and we'll get the next guy. Maybe the next guy's not as good, but he'll be good enough. And like, yeah, and what and it's good in the sense that it allows the military to be flexible, to be sort of perpetual in a way where when you come in, because we don't depend on a single person, when you show up, you're you're less like it's less likely things are going to fall apart. But it means that you may not get the individual attention on your way out, like you were saying. We had three days. The program I went, I left active duty in 2012. I left from Vicenza, Italy, which is where the 173rd Airborne is headquartered. And when I found out we had a unit in Italy, I was like, hold on a second. Why, why, why wasn't this on all the recruiting commercials? Like, this <laughs> like no offense to Fort Nowhere, but like, why the hell would I want to live there when I could go to Italy? I only left, I left active duty because I had to leave Italy. And I was like, hey, I'd like to go to these other nice places. And 
the branch manager understandably was like, listen, man, you were just in Italy for years. Like you got to take one for the team. And I was like, how about I just leave and go to the national guard? But yeah, on my way out of Italy, three day course. And I was lucky. I had my degree. I'd had at least more. And I joined right after I got my degree. So I still joined relatively young, but not like, man, there were people in basic training where they were like, I mean, you are old and wise. I'm like, bro, I'm like 22. Like, but, but they'd never been on, they're like 17, never been on a plane before and had their mom sign so they could join the military. So I was lucky to at least have some experience out there in the regular world. And I had a degree, right, which is at least a start on right. getting some sort of career going. I had the GI Bill in my back pocket. I knew I was going to law school at that point. But, yeah, there's not a lot of transition that happens necessarily. I remember when they talked about um, how much health insurance costs and the E6 with, like, 11 kids or some shit was like <laughs> – <laughs> and he had this look on his face like can i can i get back in like i kind of i kind of hate this but i also like it more than being completely broke so maybe maybe i can make this work but no it is a transition and it was definitely something that um i was lucky to be around law students for another reason besides the one i mentioned earlier they were good people who were completely different from me so my judgment was more about i had to I, at some point i was like Maybe they don't have the skills that I value because nobody taught them, not because they just don't have the ability to learn them. And that was the first thought that led me down the path towards the book was like, they just didn't get trained. They aren't bad people. They aren't, definitely aren't dumb people. Like, so they're just a product of their environment, like most all of us are. Well, um, you know, you hit on a, another good point. You know, with everything in this big mixing bowl is, you know, we have to, we have to put all these ingredients in and mentorship is huge. So when you bring up, like you see different people in your in your uh, unit, some aren't um, as fortunate as you. You have maybe a, a better upbringing or better mentoring, more more uh, influential people in your life than those uh, who may have served with you, and that's why it's so important for you and for everybody else that has served, uh, currently serving, to mentor our younger generation. And it's built into the military in a way it's not built into other places. And for good reason. It's not that, one. Of, as Sam mentioned, I did a bunch of research because the last thing I wanted to do was write a book that was just wrong, right? That was like, here's one dude's impression of how the world works. And then there's a bunch of studies showing that he's wrong. And that was actually just his life, right? So I wanted to at least confirm that stuff that was instincts to me or stuff I'd gathered through experience was if it had been looked into by people who were doing legit research, at least lined up with. And if it didn't line up, then I could figure out why. And maybe I was wrong. Maybe they were asking a different question, whatever. But I definitely looked into it. And one of the things I looked into were mentorship programs. They're like, okay, there are companies that care about this. I had a mentor at the first law firm I was at. But it is so complicated to set up and run a mentorship program. And it is a whole separate skill set. The military specializes in that. And specializes in training people because if you're not in combat, you're training to be there, right? And obviously, there's jobs that are more related to garrison and peacetime and jobs that aren't. But in general, that's the philosophy. Man, a, a law firm has lawsuits to deal with. It has deals to do. Like, if they're good at mentorship, that's a whole different skill set. And it could not only was it not helping out, but it could hurt people's careers. If they were assigned a mentor, they didn't think they were that great. Because then that mentor would go around and be like, Bob, Bob's okay. And then, that, <laughs> and then people would find out. That, that, that their mentor didn't think they were that great. And they would tell everybody else, beware the mentorship program. And then the program would fall apart. So it's incredibly hard for any organization that doesn't have leadership in its DNA in the way the military does to set up a program where mentoring can happen on the level it needs to, to actually benefit people. And that's one of the, the gaps that I was trying to fill with the book is here is a, here is why you're not getting what you're getting. And I can't be everyone's mentor, obviously, but I can try to give some, some steps that people can use to get going on their own path where they will hopefully encounter people that can fill that role for them. Yeah. And we're going to dive uh, deep into the book when we come back from our next break. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. Interested in starting a podcast or TV show? Worried about what you'll say and how to keep it engaging? Think you'd like to be a guest on podcast, radio, or TV shows? Hi, I'm Susan Hamilton, owner and founder of OBBM Network, and I would like to invite you to an OBBM Media Training to get the tools you need for a relaxed and polished performance you'll be proud to share. Our specialized training techniques include role play, voice training, and everything you need to deliver a confident, clear, and engaging interaction. Go to offbeatbusiness.com. 
Go to the calendar and register for a training that's convenient for you. Dates available now, 214-714-0495. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam, with uh, U.S. Army veteran John McLaughlin and author of the book, uh, Ooh, just slipped my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't have it up there. How to deal with damn near anything. That's, that's why there's two hosts. It's how fine. to deal with damn near everything, except especially forget forgetfulness. <laughs> no, this or is not. uh yeah. It is. Um, why don't we just dive right in because right. people need to know how to dan- how to deal with damn near anything. I, I, John, I'm even screwing up the title. So, uh, I can't change the title, so we'll just have to make it work. It's too late. No, no. It's a fine title because everybody says it. Everybody, you know, right. everybody in their mind says it. It's like, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this? Yeah. And you're telling them how to deal with damn near everything. So exactly. It does, it does have a catchy uh, title. Well, so so we got we got self awareness, initiative, efficiency, adaptability, I- insistence, and uh, so those are the five inner traits. Let's let's dive into self-awareness because all right you got to start with like damn there are some serious damn moments in that chapter thank you so i picked obviously you have to distill these big ideas down into something more approachable so i picked five traits that i thought best summarized what the tools that the military gives people that aren't available or at least not nearly as easily available elsewhere so those are the, what you named are the five traits that i picked And the first was self-awareness because it is hard to improve if you're not honest about what you need to improve. And there's a couple ways in which the military uniquely, or at least unusually, helps you build that that aren't available elsewhere. And the first, or just to give one example, is you spend so much time around people. It is hard to put up a fake version of yourself and keep it up for that amount of time. It's like standing on your head. For, for five minutes, maybe, but for hours and hours and hours. When you're at one point, I was going to Kyrgyzstan with uh, a co worker, and our, pla- our plane got delayed for a week. There was only one plane a week. Bad <laughs> weather meant you fly next week. So we're looking at each other like, guess we're hanging out for the next week in Kyrgyzstan, the two of us. We didn't know anybody else there. And I, when I say Kyrgyzstan, I mean the Air Force Base. We weren't, the way the security was at that moment, we weren't allowed to leave. So you spend so much time around people that you get to know them. Doesn't mean you're going to be best friends with everybody. But you get a much more real version of everyone else, and they get a more real version of you. And that encourages people to be honest with themselves and because the rewards for being fake are just – they're a lot lower. And the other thing that helps with the military is you always get fresh people around you. People cycle out constantly. And one of the things I ran into in research was something called pro-social lying. And what pro-social lying is it's when people who like you lie to you to make you feel better. And that's understandable sometimes. Like if somebody just got out of a a really bad breakup, maybe immediately is not the time to tell them it was kind of their fault, right? But at some point, you do need to at least try to sprinkle in some honesty. And that's hard for people to do because you want to be supportive. And that can be difficult to do if the people you're trying to support aren't up for hearing it, especially if uh, it happens repeatedly. So those are ways in which – and the military just cycles out people all the time. Your supervisor hasn't – known you for 20 years so they don't have that that friendly incentive to protect your feelings they're going to be blunt with you about what you're doing well and wrong and those are things people can try to cultivate in their normal lives but that aren't as easy to find unless you take some purposeful steps to make your life more that way to be a little more not a lot you don't have to share your drama with everyone we all know overshares and i'm definitely not encouraging that but to give people just enough info so that they can give you realistic feedback and to encourage people to be honest with you by not snapping back at them when they are honest, even if it's not what you wanted to hear in that moment. Do you think we live in a society where people are really being that honest with each other? Do you, I mean, in, in different circles, maybe maybe some are honest, but in, in a lot of other, you know, a lot of, you know, places, people aren't as honest. They just kind of give you that what you want to hear type of thing, you know? Um, from what I've seen, you know, because being self-aware, you know, I know it's hard for me, especially because um, I know a lot of different people out there. And I'm like, I just want to bitch slap them or throw a punch them and just be like, dude, you know, you screwed up. And I'm just like, yeah, good job. Good job. Oh, and, I, you know, hoping one day they'll just fall off a cliff. But how do you be how do you how do you really get to be that honest? Because you, when you care about someone's feelings and you don't want to hurt their feelings, 
it, it's a it's a tough road to navigate. Well, the good news is, in order for you to get better, you just got to encourage other people to be honest with you. Because how honest you get to be with others is kind of up to them. Because if you're honest with somebody and they don't want to hear it, then that's it. Right? You can try it once or twice, but eventually there's going to be drama or they're going to put up a wall or they're going to they're going to get mad at you. But that is their problem, not yours. So the main thing for you to improve, for me to improve, was making sure that people felt like they could be honest with me because I have a strong personality. And I'm all up for feedback. But if you have a strong personality, it can definitely come across as not being up for that. So one example in law school, there was a friend of mine. She was engaged to a Marine or to a former Marine. And I was like, okay, you've been around the military a little bit. This is in my head. I'm like, you've been around the military a little bit. You you have like an informed opinion. So I I was friendly with her classmate, but we didn't like hang out. I didn't know her that well. So, so at one point after class one day, I was like, hey, you got a second? And she said, sure. So chatted a little bit. I said, would you mind if like every couple weeks I just tapped you on the shoulder and was like, hey, how have I been doing? Have I been too sarcastic? Have I been too blunt? Have I not read the room well? Because I had gotten, I had started to realize not only that that was happening, but that it needed to change for me to get where I wanted to be. And she's like, sure. And I, I held my end of the bargain and that I, it was occasional and it was brief. I wasn't trying to take up a ton of her time and energy. But I tried to set the standard of like, hey, you can be honest with me. And she'd be like, hey, these last few weeks have been pretty good, except that one thing you said on Facebook. That was not, that did not go over. I was like, noted. Don't need. And if it's something I was strongly attached to, then okay. Then at least I can do the math. I can be like, hey, that's something I felt really strongly about. Even if people didn't like it, it meant enough to me to do that. Or you're like, I thought that was that was just a random comment. I wasn't emotionally invested in that. I can I could not do that in the future and not even worry about it. And there were definitely instances where I was like, this is easy money. I can stop doing that. I don't really care. If, it, if that's really rubbing people the wrong way, I'll, I'll stop that tomorrow. So it's more about encouraging other people to be honest with you. And then you try to surround yourself with other people who are the same way. But at the end of the day, that's their journey. And I wish them luck, but I'm not in control of it. And I'm not going to stress if they go in a direction that's not helpful for them. That's I can't I can't stress about what I can't control unless it's uh, yeah. absolutely necessary. Right. Yeah, there you go. So so I did I did say we we're diving in the deep end right when we started this. So we we're going to continue our conversation with John McLaughlin, author of How to Deal with Damn Near Anything. We'll be right back, folks. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome to Heroes in Action. I'm Ray Amanat, founder and creator of this training system. I originally made it so that everyone can train for free. We have programs for kids, for women, families, and businesses. I'm an author, speaker, and educator on everything that has to do with violence and bullying prevention education. If you'd like more information about who we are and what our programs are, please go to our website at heroesinaction.us or give me a call if you have any questions at 727-314-2534. We hope to see you here to train. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with Jonathan. I always get a kick out of that guy's commercial. Uh, for, I don't know why. I just, I just get a kick out of his commercial. Uh, with John McLaughlin, uh, U.S. Army veteran and author of... I'll bring it closer. Oh, my, brain, yes. my glasses. How to deal with damn near anything. You don't have to memorize it. You just got to buy it. All right? <laughs> yeah, it's a... I, I, I remember it. I'm just in a loss for words. Uh, you know, when we when we uh, broke before the commercial, you brought about um, you you can't stress over things that you don't con that you can't control. You shouldn't stress over, and a lot of us do that. A lot of us make it a point that we we stress over things that are really out of our control and we can't fix. And we let that weigh on. It's like we're holding a, a heavy cup that we're refusing to put down and walk away from. So that's one of the uh, great traits that you everybody should learn within themselves and be honest with themselves. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that forward. What's the next one? What What's trait number two, Sam? Initiative. So the idea behind picking that was, and these traits are a mix. Some of these are, are things you've heard before, right? Well, I'm not going to come up with five new words, right? So sometimes the challenge is how do you talk to people about a concept they've heard before in a way that's going to resonate with them? So initiative was next after self-awareness, because once you know what you need to do, you need to do it. 
And my favorite example from the military for that involved basic training in the army. And I actually got to interview the, the guy who was the senior enlisted leader, the command sergeant major at infantry school and who oversaw a huge change to basic training. You may be familiar with the obviously drill sergeants with the hats and the yelling, right? And the hats and the yelling are real, but they serve a purpose. And what they realized is a particular event they had where a ton of drill sergeants would flood in when basic trainees got there the very first day and just surround them from all sides yelling at them. And they realized it wasn't working. And they realized proactively, there was no scandal, nobody fell over and died, there was no abuse allegations. They just realized that proactively, they took the initiative to take a look at this thing that had been a tradition for a long time. And like, is this working? And they realized, no, it wasn't. And the problem wasn't drama. It was that people were quietly leaving afterwards. So it wasn't the ones that were complaining about it. Nobody, you know, writing books about how bad their military experience was instead of how good it was. They took the initiative to take a look at even something that had been important and well-known and think, is this the best way we could be doing this? And they came up with the answer being no. That it made people feel like the drill sergeants were people they couldn't go to with problems, that they were to be avoided as much as anything. And that meant the connection that they needed to have the best possible training quality wasn't being forged. And so they changed it. So that's why I picked initiative because the military, even though it's been around a long time and has a lot of, uh, seems very formal, seems very strict to the outside viewer. And there's parts of it that are still can take the initiative to change something, even that that thing has existed for decades. Yeah. One of the things I, I know in my law enforcement career, I, the thing that would grate on me is because this is the way it's always been done. Yeah. And it was like, Oh my God. This like there's a prize because you've right. been making of the mistake the longest. Like that's yeah. the competition. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and from, from there, you know, you go into the next one, we'll talk about efficiency because you, you've got to, once you decide we're not doing it this way anymore because it's not working it's building that plan and then getting to it, but being efficient about it. So a lot of us, we, we get this big grand plan. Okay. We're, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to, we're going to change it to this go. And it's like taking spaghetti and throwing it, you know, the noodles at the wall and seeing what sticks. And, and from your book, we know that that doesn't work. Yeah. Throw one noodle at a time is my yeah. advice. <laughs> like the, and just skip the sauce entirely. But no, the efficiency piece came from seeing a lot of people I knew trying super hard, but trying almost too hard in a way that it's like trying to punch somebody by just taking your fist back as far as it will possibly go. And then like trying to cartoon Superman punch. No, that's not how it works. You, your form has to be right. You have to shift your weight just the right way. It's about being precise. It's about making sure your effort goes in the right times and places, not about cranking your effort up to a thousand. It was also designed as a contrast, and I have nothing but respect for these dudes, but a lot of the guys who write books about the military, they're selling intensity, right? It's get up at 3 a.m., do 10 million push-ups, run 5,000 miles like Forrest Gump, but more. Like mm -hmm. just that, It's all about cranking the dial all the way up until the dial falls off completely. And I, that is not that's what I have seen. From what I've seen, people who aren't getting where they want to be, it's not because they are not intense enough. It's because that the energy they are putting out there, if they've gotten past those first two stages, but they got the awareness and they're trying things, they've shown initiative, it's that the energy's not going in the right places, the effort's not going in the right places. And you mentioned that people will want to keep doing something because they've been doing it forever. Well, that's a that's a bad use. That's an inefficient way. It's like standing in a grocery line and a new line opens up and you're like, Well, I've been standing in this line. Like I'm you're not personally invested in the line. Get in the new one. There's no there's one person in it. And there's eight people in front of you. Switch lines. And on a more serious level, it can be like, I've I've been friends with this person for 10 years. Yeah, but are they doing what a friend should do now? That's what matters. Now, that doesn't mean you bail immediately if the answer is no. You're like, bye, change my number. Good luck. But you have to start making that adjustment. And you have to start being willing to make those changes. And again, in an efficient way, because you try to do this like, you know, F you to everyone that you don't like. That's just going to cause more drama and eat up more energy and, and put you further away from where you want to be. It's about being smart and being precise about where you spend your time and effort. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're, we're skipping through the book. You got, you got to get the book because it's truly what we're talking about. We're hitting the, the highlights and the chapters go in deep and you can really, if you've been through, you know, 
trauma experiences, if you are sitting in stress every day, if you are trying to get your career to the next level and you just seem to be hitting roadblocks, right here, right here, folks. We got to take our next break. We will be right back to continue our discussion with author and airborne veteran, John McLaughlin. How to deal with damn near anything. A paratrooper's guide to life. Be right back. To the Health Engineer Show, I'm Cliff Buckley, the Health Engineer, right here on the Alpha. Hi, I'm Larry Cortez. Hi, my name is Susan Hamilton, and you're watching Alpha. Hi, this is Dorian Milano. Welcome to Big Ideas Small Business, where we will be talking to Terry Arjala. Hey, welcome back to the Badge of Honor Podcast with John and Sam, and U.S. Paratrooper John McLaughlin, an author of. How to deal with damn near anything. You notice that? Look at me, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, these are traits for success in, internal success, you know, and it's things that everybody should guide, you know, have with them the tools they need to, to walk their path to success, to, to a mentally healthy um, conclusion in their life. No matter what you're, you're going for, if it's going to, be um, a CEO or in big business, or if you're doing something with a non-for-profit, or if you're just trying to gather people together to um, become stronger than they were. Uh, so all these traits are inside values that we all need to learn. We all need to start putting our, our feet forward with it. When we talk about getting off the couch mentality, you know, it's getting off the couch and moving forward. But as we move forward, we have to put these tools you have to have tools in place as you walk. You're going to walk to nowhere. And yeah. as you walk, perfect segue, partner there. As you walk, you got to be adaptable, which is the next. Uh, we got adaptability and insistence. And adaptability, that chapter, whew, I mean, I'm thinking I, I, every time, I, just that word, OODA loop, like you can't stay stuck. Take a step forward. Let's let's dive into adaptability. Now, it. No matter how great a plan you have, no matter how genuinely committed you are to executing that plan, fate doesn't care. Like the two weeks from now, you're gonna like something crazy is gonna come in. You look at the past half a dozen presidents, and the biggest thing they've had to deal with, and nobody had any idea was going to happen. Whether it was COVID, whether it was 9/11, whether it was a financial crisis, there's always and whatever calculus people went into when they were choosing who to vote for, you know. I hope that I hope that also applied to that too. So you have to both on a huge level and on an individual level be adaptable. And you can, the plan is not the point. Like you have to have the plan to start with, but the plan is not the goal. The plan is only worth following to the degree where it's going to get you where you want to be. And if the plan and reality start to diverge even a little bit, then you need to go with reality. You need to adapt what you're doing. You know, I thought that going to law school was going to do X, Y, and Z for me. And it did X, Y, and like a third of Z, but then it definitely didn't do some of the other things. All right. So how, okay, great. It was mostly a win, right? Okay. What, what do I do with that? I can't just commit to becoming what I thought I wanted to be three years ago, five years ago. Now, I've never been the kind of guy people ask, where do you want to be five years from now? I've done, I only recently have I had a semi-coherent answer to that because the version of me that exists five years from now is going to be a different guy in some level, probably not a wildly different one, but a different one on, on some level and some meaningful one. So you have to be willing to switch stuff up because part of the danger of partial success is it can make people resistant to change. If you have a somewhat successful business, if you have a somewhat uh, stable group of friends, you, you can be worried, understandably, that switching things up is going to risk what you already have. But the way to avoid that is to make sure you're switching the right things. And it's not just change for change's sake. There's always a joke in the military. Somebody's going to come in and issue a bunch of new orders just to show they're in charge, right? That's obviously the wrong thing. You don't change stuff just to change it. You got to think about what you're adapting. But given how quick the world changes and how inevitable that change is, if you're not adjusting at least occasionally or a little bit, you're probably going to get into a place where the plan doesn't work anymore. Yeah, and that's where uh, my glasses here insistence comes in because the, the the biggest question jumped out at me is 
who are you competing against? Yeah, and it story. The, insistence is the one the reason i ended with it is it's the one it's the least familiar word right people know what initiative means but insistence was sort of the the capstone the, the one that crowns the others and the reason it does that is because it is about getting past temporary circumstances and looking towards something more fundamental when you've developed a kind of there's different words for it a code an ethos a philosophy or just a set of values that you want to live by, specific goals that you might have, and not allowing yourself to get distracted from it. Obviously, distractions happen, but not to stay distracted from it by whatever people happen to be around you. And it's funny because you see in sports, you're always like, this guy would have won five championships, but he played the same time Michael Jordan did, so he won zero or two or whatever the, you know, the case may be. You don't always have control over that sort of thing. And life is not a directly competitive thing most of the time in the way that sports are. So don't get caught up. You mentioned earlier social media and uh, people, how much are people uh, being honest with each other around those things? I think that ties back to this particularly, John, because people get competitive and not necessarily in a screw that person, I'm going to be better than them, but measuring themselves against somebody else's curated perfect version of their lives. And that that kind of stuff is unreliable. You can't you cannot measure success based off what other people choose to present to you. And insistence is all about putting up boundaries, put have, making sure you're living by your values and incorporating change. It doesn't mean you give up adaptability, right? There's a reason insistence is last. You've gone through these other steps already, but it's about understanding that you need to ensure that you have boundaries and standards and you enforce those. Otherwise the world will just run you right over. Now, how long did it take you to, you know, sit down and get this thing written? Because as people, you know, listening to this podcast today, uh, that reading through this book for me over the past three days, it's like, this is some deep stuff. Again, lots of studies cited in here to back up um, what you're saying. And it's you know, a matter of love. You wanted to make it good, not suck. Yeah, I just yeah, I don't want a crappy book. My name's on that thing. Like you know, like people are going I'd rather just not write one than write a terrible one. Like it doesn't have to be amazing. I mean, I think it's pretty good at least. It's worth, you know, however much you paid for it, wherever you are. Uh, but it's you know, it, it it mattered to me. So part of it was a product of the pandemic, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't know, talk about adapting to new circumstances. I don't know if 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 I hadn't been working from home and it was about having been away from full-time military for the right amount of time and then having the being in the right circumstances to to create something like that so start to finish probably something like a year if you include just working through the publisher getting the edits done getting the cover designed um and the acknowledgments uh, at the beginning uh, the dedication is both to my wife mk and then to uh, a, a very close friend chelsea who served as a, a sounding board through the whole process. So you, you add all those steps together, I think a year is a good estimate, maybe a little less, but definitely not uh, not too much less. Yeah, well, you can, uh, again, <clears throat> pick up how to deal with damn near anything, a paratrooper, the paratrooper's guide to life. Uh, anywhere books are sold online. Uh, if you go to John's uh, website, which I'll put up on the screen here for everybody that's listening, it's johnmclaughlin.com and his last name is spelled M-C-G-L-O-T-H-L-I-N. Um, so go to his website. You can grab, uh, he has got the link um, to the book there as well as more uh, about him. And guys, like I said, we glossed over, we flew through um, how to get through wherever you are in life, whatever you want to do, whether it's completely starting over, whether you're stuck with something and you're trying to solve a problem, whether you're transitioning into a different career, um, whether you've got some, you know, some shit that's pissing you off. Yep. <laughs> whether you've got unresolved trauma or a trauma that's like, has you stuck. Again, this is, I, I don't want to simplify it by saying it's a recipe, but a lot, we understand what a recipe is in order to have whatever you're making be successful. You have to go step by step by step. It's a deep dive. It's a dive that's worth it. 
because I mean, let's face it. How, how many times do you get to like learn from a real life paratrooper right. to John? Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your service to this country. Certainly. Um, and, and the stories that you share, um, jumping out, uh, you know, being first out of the airplane, the, the stuff that you learned in the, the military that you took, and the stuff that you learned not that wasn't going to work. You know, it was a transition. We don't think about that. We yeah. don't think about that. A lot of books are written like, this is what worked. They don't point out what didn't work. And we need to understand why they didn't work. So thank you uh, for doing that as well. Uh, John, you, John, co-host John, you got anything? <laughs> oh, um. You know, you, you mentioned your wife, MK. I want to give her a big shout out. Thank what, you. I looked at your bio. She's an artist. Is she the, the artist of the cover of the book? No, actually. She oh, is okay. a painter. So she paint does classic, you know, acrylic or oil sort of fine art paintings. So okay. she she was a trusted advisor on that <laughs> and many other parts of it. Um, but that, that is not her creation specifically. She has many other fine works, though. Okay. Well, it is a super creative. No, it would have been fun, but no, just different. We know what self awareness. The the last thing I would do is ask her. She would ask me to do something that wasn't in the right skill set. So better that I show her the cover and get her thoughts on it than have her do something she would have been comfortable with. So it worked out perfectly. Just the right level of teamwork. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's a it's a great cover, and um, it did it doesn't really translate on the screen right here, but. It's got all these arrows and X's, so it, it's it's the map uh, on the cover. So it's very, very cool. Thank you again Thank you, uh, for sharing everything with us tonight on the podcast. Again, folks, go to johnmclaughlin.com. Grab uh, the book. Um, you will not be able to put it down. It's It's a pretty, it's a deep read, but it's a quick read because it's all relevant to your life. So go grab that today. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, we'll be in touch, John, for sure. Thanks Thank for you, having John. me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Yeah. You can get John's book on Amazon, on all the book websites. I'm just, I was just searching, you know, every, every um, website has his book. So whatever you use, yeah. you know, you can purchase it from. Absolutely. And, and, you know, um, because we do this show, uh, every week, John, and we really, we talk about the stress and the overwhelm and the burnout and post-traumatic stress. It's, I, I can't emphasize it enough, John, you and I have talked about it with, with Jeff and John that, you know, part of the healing journey, while it is your journey, cause it's your trauma is really branching out and taking on new experiences and learning new ways to navigate through the place where you're you're finding yourself and you know for me it's reading and taking new ideas and switching things up a, a little because we can all fall into the well i'm just going to do it this way because it works or like i said we're going to do it this way because we've done it this way for 20 years right. can we have to stop approaching life uh like that and um, so, yeah, go, go pick up the book. And, and it brings to mind, um, you know, PTSD 911, the movie. It just premiered in Pittsburgh. And we've been following Conrad all across the country. They're on, on the bike tour, um, bringing the film to uh, all the cities. Guys, you know, you can find everything on our website a badge of honor.com. Super simple. Find out where, uh, Conrad is by clicking on, um, the logo, find out how you can support the film. You want to see the film. Trust us. Yeah. You, you definitely want to see the film, especially if you are, uh, you know, in the military, a veteran first responder family of any of the above, um, to really understand. And then going beyond that, uh, our, our good friends at NAMI Ops, which um, is the Overwatch peer support program, they're having their, their first inaugural fundraiser. And uh, you can click on the Overwatch logo on our website and find out how you can support them. If you're a, a first responder department, police, fire, EMS, whatever, and you want to put together peer support, 
that's where you want to go to NAMI Ops to do that. You want to get trained. They are incredible. If you're struggling and you need peer support, NAMI Ops, you want to talk with the folks that uh, can walk, that have been there, been in the trenches with you. They understand what you're going through. So um, seek them out. Again, all of the resources of our partners you can find on our website, including the calendar of events. We've got uh, events coming up. We've got Walk the Bridge this month. Um, we, we're going to have workshops, which are going to kick off again uh, to start off in the fall. And um, I might be getting a message maybe that I froze. Am I frozen? No, I think I'm frozen. Okay, okay I think you froze. <laughs> it's uh, I'm frozen. You're frozen. Can you hear me? What I can hear you. You look great. You look great. Frozen. I'm frozen now. I'm just saying. I'm, but I'm frozen on the screen. <laughs> I didn't know if you could hear me, but I'm frozen on screen. We can definitely hear you. So to all of uh, the veterans out there, thank you so much for serving. Thank you for supporting and fighting for our freedom. So John and I can do shows like this every single uh, every single week. Bring you exciting stuff. Um, for those of you on active duty that are protecting our shores, thank you for what you do for our first responders that are out there protecting us at home. We are praying for you every single day. Know that you are not alone here at a badge of honor and a badge of honor podcast. We hear you. You need help. Do the most courageous thing you can do for yourself. Raise your hand and say, I need help. We're right there walking that journey with you. John, take us home. Well, I know I'm frozen, so all you can hear is my voice. But uh, it's, you know, what, what resonated on this whole show is a recipe for success. Um, I'm, I'm into cooking, so I'm always changing up my recipe and uh, finding out what tastes good and what doesn't. So um, don't be afraid to change up your recipe and, um, and, and do what works for you. That's great. And we will see you next week, everybody. So stay safe out there. Thanks for joining us. Take care, everybody. Take care. A Badge of Honor podcast is produced for the OBBM Network podcast and protected under copyright law. For content permissions, please submit your request to abadgeofhonor.com on the content page. For OBBM Network programming information, please call 214-714-0495 today.